Hey everybody, welcome to a very special episode of The Fabric of History. I'm your host, Mary Patterson, and as ever, I am joined by one of my favorite colleagues, Gary Coletti. Oh, hi, but thank you. Yes, happy Constitution Day, everybody. So as you can imagine, for employees of the Bill of Rights Institute, the Constitution is a pretty big deal. And when September 17th rolls around, that's Constitution Day, we jump on the opportunity to talk about how the Constitution affects our lives. This year, we're celebrating Constitution Day by exploring the ways liberty and equality interact in the Constitution and how we continue to balance these principles in our lives. For this special episode of The Fabric of History, we're exploring how the Constitution connects with student expression in the 21st century. And to help us out, we are beyond excited to be joined by Nick Capodice of the Civics 101 podcast. Nick, thank you so much for being with us today. Mary and Gary, the pleasure is absolutely more than half mine. Delighted to be here on this day of days, Constitution Day. <laughs> So if you have not checked out the Civics 101 podcast, I highly recommend that you do. It's a podcast refresher course on the basics of how democracy works. Not only are we big fans of the Constitution, but we're super huge fans of democracy. And they cover everything from Magna Carta to moving day at the White House. So it's, it's really a great listen. So again, check it out. And again, Nick, we're super happy that you're with us. The road of admiration goes two ways, Mary. Thank you so much. <laughs> So as you guys watch this video, think of questions that you'd like to ask Nick, Gary, and I. Nick will be back with us on Constitution Day to answer your questions live. And you can follow the link below to submit questions and receive a variety of useful resources, videos, e-lessons on the Constitution as we lead up to the day itself. So let's jump right in, shall we? I'm ready to go. All right. So Gary, you are very big on this idea of taking things for granted, or I think that that's something you, you've mentioned on our podcast before. And I think that- I, I'm sorry, am I a fan <laughs> of taking things for granted? You, you mean like looking at things that we take for granted and exploring that's it right. deeper, I think? Gotcha, gotcha. Yes, I am a fan of that. <laughs> so I think the constitution is one of those things, right? Because I, I know I don't wake up in the morning and go, oh my God, I'm so excited that we have the first amendment. But in reality, <laughs> maybe I should because you know the freedom of expression and the other rights enshrined in that first amendment, they're incredibly powerful. But if you are talking about school and social media, then it starts to get messy. And we do love a good messy um, situation to talk through here on this podcast. Absolutely, on a day like today as well, sort of focusing, I mean, that's a big question. That's our, 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 our we're big fans of the big questions, but drilling down even more into what does it mean for students, I think is a great question. You had asked that before, right? So if it's constitution day, well, what does that mean for student expression and, and in their lives? And, and I'm so glad Nick is here because I think even starting with that, I mean, wh where in the constitution, you know, wh where can we go to the constitution to <laughs> think more about these things to not take for granted about students and their their rights of expression. Yeah, I think about this all the time. Uh, we were we did an episode on the Bill of Rights, and we were delighted to have uh, Dr. Bob from the Bill of Rights Institute on that episode, as well as a wonderful scholar named Woody Holton. Um, it, it's a funny contrast because you know Dr. Bob was all about the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment, and Woody Holton, whom I love in a bit of a waggish way, referred to the Bill of Rights as a tub to a whale. You know, it's a thing that happened, but you know nobody really thought about it at the time, and yet it has become my favorite part of the Constitution. I dare say many people out there watching this. And the First Amendment uh, was my gateway to civics, was studying the First Amendment in college. Um, so it has become this big thing. But the question to your question, Gary, like where in the Constitution does it say, you know, students have or don't have freedom of expression? Um, nowhere. I, I don't believe the word student is even in the Constitution. And these uh, amendments, which we hold so dear, were not actually, uh, no laws were struck down for being unconstitutional in regards to the First Amendment until the 1920s. And that blew my mind when I first learned that. It wasn't until, you know, Schenck, Gitlow, and Whitney and other of these cases in the 1920s that people started to say, well, this speech is constitutional. This speech could be considered, uh, you know, not protected uh, by the Constitution. And it's only through the interpretation of the Constitution from the Supreme Court that we do have a definition of speech, specifically also when it comes to students. 
Okay, so starting with the foundation of the of questions about the Constitution, and as you rightly said, um, you know you have to get to interpretation. I'm hearing, look to Supreme Courts. Look to I love the word cases when it comes to Supreme Court. Right, <laughs> it's it, it, what's the case? Like it's a particular thing, but it's about something bigger. Um, and so I guess I mean, is it yeah. a given that we're talking about students? We're talking, you know, they are citizens. They have voices. That's something that. You know, I know in our, our programs, the big thing that we talk about is, you know, we, we want to hear from students. We, you know, they, they have things to say and do and express themselves. So what I'm hearing, if I'm if I'm correct, is let's look to some Supreme Court cases. Yeah. Kind of shine a light on this big question. Let's see how we got here. I would love to do that. OK. I think a really good point of departure for us is the very recent Supreme Court ruling in the Mahanoy Area School District. Case. Oh, very so good choice. Yeah, but this is, um, this case is all about, well, before we get, to, it's about First Amendment and can you, can public school officials regulate off campus student speech. So this is, I think, where it gets messy because especially in, you know, today's world, where is the line between being on campus and being off campus. So before I get, before I get ahead of myself, let me, let's lay out just the basic facts of the case here. So this, uh, the decision was issued in June of 2021. So again, very recent case. Wow. Wow. And so what happens is a student, uh, she was a cheerleader in the Mahanoy area high school. She posted a Snapchat video where she was, basically she was upset because she didn't make the varsity cheerleading squad. So, you know, she's 14 years old. And as you can imagine, I know I was kind of, dramatic <laughs> as a word <laughs> myself. She's very upset. And in this Snapchat, she says, you know, she's talking negatively about school, about cheerleading, about her coaches. And it's a Snapchat and she's off campus and it's not during school hours, but other students show the Snapchat to the coaches. And because of this, she is um, suspended from the squad and she's, you know, she gets in trouble. So her father and her end up, you know, challenging the school, and then they end up bringing it to court, saying you know, this violated her First Amendment rights. And I think what's really, I mean, there's so many things that are interesting about this. So I'm not sure where to go first. But ultimately, what the Supreme the Supreme Court rules in favor of the cheerleader, and says that um, punishing her violated her First Amendment rights. So those are the very basic basic, basic facts of the case. Well, the one thing we maybe should throw in there is that she wasn't just speaking negatively about the cheerleading team, but uh, she used some rather uh, harsh expletives that I would have been punished in school for using at the time too. So, you know, that's just one more thing to sort of keep in the, in the back balance of it. But to your point, I think the most important thing is uh, sort of when this happened and how this happened, uh, what time of day this happened for uh, the cheerleader. I mean, I think that brings up a great point, again, for those watching, and perhaps you're already developing some questions here. Nick, I was wondering if you could help us out with, if we're going to be utilizing Supreme Court cases to shine a light on the Constitution and what it does, are there elements within cases we should take a look at, even in this particular case, that can help us kind of see more clearly the different things we should be looking for? Yeah, that's a, what, what, a, what a great thing to ask. Um, there is a, a great trio of words that we sort of think about when we think about Supreme Court cases and protections of speech in particular. Uh, in speech, it's the uh, time, place, and manner of speech, the old TPM. So when you, when you make the thing of speech, the place where you do it, and the manner. The, you know, so this is, we're exploring the time, place, and manner. So when did our cheerleader make that snap? Uh, sorry, snap that chat. Uh, <laughs> uh, wh where was she when she snapped that chat? And and what was the manner? So it was outside of school hours. Um, it was, I've imagined that in her home. And the manner was on Snapchat. So you take all those things into, uh, into question because schools are allowed to police speech uh, while students are in school. And we can talk more about that a little bit down the line. But those are the things you want to kind of consider and that these justices were considering when they handed down this decision. So that's really important if I can jump in on that in terms of we you mentioned before sort of past experiences right past cases that sort of willed this down I mean that that phrase the time place and manner 
I also don't know that that's in the constitution necessarily, <laughs> that's true. right? And so <laughs> it came about. So, so I'm wondering if it's worth sort of backtracking and say like, how did we even get to that in the first place? Yeah. Um, should we go back to, I mean, how far back should we go, Gary? Oh, Mary, uh, where, where do you want to go? To the dawn here. of time? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I think if, if we want to explore this sort of chronologically, we can sort of go through student speech cases and sort of investigate that and talk about that and see what y'all think about it. And if anybody out there has any questions or thoughts about this, I, we would love to hear it because this is how you explore this issue. I think, I mean, I think Tinker is the case, I mean, it's not the first case dealing with student speech, but I think that it's sort of the landmark mm -hmm. case. Like I know even before I was an employee of the Bill of Rights Institute, <laughs> that's one of the core cases I just remember from learning in school. I feel like most people are familiar with that case and it's, it's kind of a big deal. It sets a big precedent. So maybe that's a good place to start. Sure. Yeah, you wanna talk about Tinker? Sure. It's my favorite Supreme Let's Court it. case. Well, I mean, it's my... now, now we have to. <laughs> um, for anybody who hasn't heard of Tinker v. Des Moines, then welcome, because that's how I was when I started working at Civics 101. I had not heard of Tinker v. Des Moines. I did not know any rules about Supreme Court uh, decisions when it came to student speech. And now I am I consider myself a, a friend of Mary Beth Tinker. Mm -hmm. um, Mary Beth Tinker, her brother John, and a colleague uh, of theirs at school, Chris Everett, I believe was his name, they uh, joined a planned protest. This was in, 19, in the late 1960s during the Vietnam War. They wore black armbands to school to protest the deaths on both sides in the Vietnam War. Mary, and her Mary Beth and her brother John were Quakers. They abhorred violence in any way, shape, or form, in any time, place, and manner. And uh, they wore these armbands to school and the teachers uh, warned them they could not wear black armbands to school, and they wore them anyway. Um, and so the ACLU got in touch with the Tinkers, and they fought their case up to the Supreme Court. And the, the question was, uh, can you wear a black armband in protest while you're at school? And the court ruled, and I believe it was seven to two, that yes, um, students do have a right to free speech while they're at school with one very large stipulation, which is it can't be disruptive. Um, what I love so much about Tinker v. Des Moines, um, one is that John and Mary Beth to this day, Mary Beth was 13 in the 1960s when she wore that armband to school. So, you know, you, you can be 13 and make a huge difference, a court case that people are fighting about to this day. Um, she was 13, she wore this armband to school. She now tours the country talking about why it's important that students have a right to freedom and expression when they're at school. She's made that her, her personal crusade, John as well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, not everybody was down with it. You know, uh, the, one of the great quotes I thought was interesting is, I believe it was Justice Black who dissented, who said he was scared that it was going to usher in a revolutionary new era of permissiveness. Mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, oh, heaven forfend, you know, the students you have you feel like that they can contribute when it comes to speech. You know, I say, you know, unabashed, Mary, Gary, to all of you out there, yes, bring on the revolutionary era of permissiveness. <laughs> I want to hear what everyone has to say, because as Mary Beth says, students, she says kids, we can say kids, students, you, whomever, have a tremendous ability to see what is unfair, more than I do, more than we three here in this room today. Mm -hmm. Students, kids, my kids, my goodness, yes, they yeah. can spot unfairness <laughs> a thousand miles away. They are a wonderful bellwether for, you know, determining what's going on in the world and what's fair and unfair. So that was a great case, right? Tinker v. Des Moines was kaboom. Students have speech in school as long as it's not disruptive. And as the years progressed, uh, the courts ruled and sort of winnowed away at that, uh, that and, and said, well, this kind of speech is not permitted and this kind of speech is not permitted and this kind of speech is not permitted. And through goodness me, 50 years, we get here where a Snapchat video, uh, if, if I'm not wrong, the uh, Mahanoy case is the first victory, the extension of students' rights in the Supreme Court since Tinker v. Des Moines in 1969, hmm. I think. I think so Tinker well there's a couple things come to mind <laughs> I know this is our thinking faces <laughs> yeah, our thinking people faces. never usually see our thinking faces on our podcast <laughs> I, do, I, I will say my this quick comment though I, I love I love that the Tinkers are still 
you know, they, they really are, even to this day, talking about students and expression and, and you know, making a stand for, for what you feel is right. Because I think so often we hear about a court case and we're like, oh, that happened then and it doesn't really matter anymore. And, you know, a lot of these Supreme Court cases that you get doled out in school, they did happen a long time ago. But here's an example of someone who was very young, like 13 is, is quite young, yeah. made it, you know, this just has a huge impact even to this day. But it didn't stop there. Like the story continues. So I love that part of the story because that's something we don't often hear. The other thing that's really the phrase that comes out of Tinker that I think is really interesting and relevant to the Mahanoy case and even beyond and what may be what come next is that students do not, quote, shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate, end quote. So I think it's the schoolhouse gate that is that's that's what's getting messy like it's if your speech is disruptive if it's you know like if it's really harmful or if it's sexually explicit which has happened in some other court cases that came to the supreme court then to me like as a as a mom and as a former teacher i feel like that makes sense to kind of shut some of that speech down but in the case of tinker it was it was you know it was something very simple it was just wearing the black armband so I feel like I went in a lot of places there. <laughs> no, I love that. I love thinking, exploring, like the, the gate has gotten quite wide, hasn't it? Uh, when does the gate begin? Um, when does the gate end? Students who are, who are te- be learning remotely is your home within the schoolhouse gate now. Um, students who are involved in extracurricular activities after school, if you're texting your friend about a play that you're in, you know, is that, are you still in the gate uh, or are you out of the gate? And people who are working from home, we feel the same way. You know, you're you're never not at work, and you're never you're always at work at the same time. Same with school when we're doing more remote learning. So I I, I think this decision, this precedent, it's gonna it's got to come up again and again and again as we're reinvestigating where that gate, Mary, begins and ends. So to drive back to where we started about the Constitution, we we've mentioned a couple of cases and. These cases, when they were occurring, may seem very different. In one, it is a young person who has uh, thoughts on a war that was happening at the time, a conflict, and ways of protesting that or calling attention to it. And the other, it was a, a personal event that, for our point of view, is modern, but uh, you know, is happening today. That uh, is, you know, is happening personally, but was trying to express themselves through a technology that did not exist decades ago. They may, on the surface, seem differently. D- different from each other. And yet we are talking to them as connected because these cases help us better understand the constitution and how it applies to students, right? So I, I suppose one you know wrap up big question I'm, I'm thinking about is, is that how it generally works? Is, is our understanding of the constitution pieced together from individual experiences or do we start with the big ideas of the constitution and apply them to these individual experiences? Or both? Well, <laughs> when, you read, when you read a Supreme Court decision, right? When you read a Supreme Court decision, what you're really gonna be looking at is precedent. You're gonna look at other cases that have been cited. And the older we get as a nation, the more precedent we have to look at. Um, and I, you know, Gary, I, it's, easy, it's easy for me to lionize Mary Beth Tinker and to take her cheerleader case and be like, yeah, but this was someone just sort of using curse words on Snapchat to say they're complete, two completely different worlds. I love that someone using uh, dropping bad words on Snapchat is given the same sort of constitutional, you know, judicial weight as somebody protesting death in a war. Because that's that's how the Constitution works. It, it applies to everybody and everything. TLOV, New Jersey, you got a 14-year-old girl smoking a butt in the girls' room and having a bag of weed in her purse. Um, Mary Beth Tinker wears an armband. Hazelwood V. Kuhlmeyer, uh, sorry, <laughs> Hazelwood V. Kuhlmeyer, um, she writes about teen pregnancy in her newspaper. Matthew Frazier makes a rude speech in front of uh, nominating his friend for uh, you know student council. I just wanted to say that all these cases regardless of if they seem of great import or not, are part of who we are as a nation when we're investigating how the Constitution applies to us. I, I will piggyback on that, Nick. I think that there was a, 
in the decision in Mahanoy, uh, Justice Stephen Breyer wrote the majority, and he had this wonderful quote about um, our cheerleader. He said, it might be tempting to dismiss Levy. Brandy Levy was her name, the cheerleader. It might be tempting to dismiss Levy's words as unworthy of the robust First Amendment protections discussed herein, but sometimes it is necessary to protect the superfluous or, you know, the seemingly silly, like this rant on Snapchat, in order to preserve the necessary. So mm. I think, I mean, we talk about these, these foundational principles, these founding principles here at BRI, like liberty, equality, your first men of protections. They are these sort of ideals, these standards that we're always using as our, our guidepost. And you're right, sometimes it's, you know, protesting a war that was terrible. I mean, all wars are terrible, but protesting war. And sometimes it's complaining. It's this rude, crude, juvenile rant about not making the varsity cheerleading squad. And so they seem, as you said, one doesn't seem so much a heavyweight as the other, but it's still, it's still your freedom of expression, right? Mm -hmm. And I think um, the ruling in Mahanoy basically it is protecting that. Sometimes kids say things that are unpopular, but you're still you still have that right to express yourself with restrictions, but this was a case in which, you know, she was off campus and they, they I mean, the decision was, um, the lower court ruled in her favor as well. And the decision was eight to one. So most of the justices are sort of across the spectrum. Mm -hmm. agree with it. So I think that's, to me, that's, that's part of the fun of it is that we have these principles that have been, that are, they're almost, they're like eternal in a way. And it's just, how do we interpret them? How do we apply them? Things always can fit underneath them. And I think that's sort of the beauty of the document itself, whether you're talking about the constitution or whether you're talking about the Bill of Rights. And in a bit more of a like fun side note way, it's also quite beautiful that these judges, mostly around the age of 60 and older, <laughs> learned a lot about Snapchat very quickly, <laughs> learned a lot about cheerleading. Um, and, you know, there are some funny quotes of these justices sort of talking about what she did and how she should be punished or not punished. But uh, you mentioned Justice Breyer. I think, Mary, you and I were talking a little earlier. There was a quote, and I hope I get it right, uh, that you told me about Justice Breyer saying that uh, classrooms are um, nurseries of democracy. Is that what it was? Yes. That, that I went to sleep last night thinking about that expression. <laughs> I can't stop thinking about it. Because, um, oh yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say, like you guys listening out there in school you are in the nursery of democracy right now and that's and meaning where things are developing and right uh, yeah are, yeah 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 and i was we recently did an episode on brown v board of education and um the judge i was interviewing mentioned the, the quote that um education is the very foundation of good citizenship that came from earl warren's opinion in brown v board of education you know School, you know, you can look at it as, as drudgery and a chore, but then in, in, in your heart of hearts, you are truly, it is the cornerstone of citizenship. It is the nursery of democracy, of figuring out civics. You know, one of my soapbox things is that civics isn't just how a bill becomes a law and the difference between the House and the Senate. Civics starts when you're one year old. Civics starts when you learn how to share toys with your brother. Civics starts when you learn what you can say and not say in kindergarten, and it never stops. It sounds to me like if the question is what the constant what does the constitution have to do with student expression? I feel like everything, a lot. I would aim as from what you're saying, it sounds like, well, student expression has a lot to do with the constitution and all the different choices and the things that on a day-to-day -day level it sounds like is it's everywhere. That's sometimes what makes it hard to see. But if you take a few moments to look, you could see it in classrooms right now that you yourselves are sitting in. So that was excellent, that was excellent. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we've come to this conclusion before on the fabric of history, but what you say matters, where you say it, how you say it. So, I mean, you may not have a Supreme Court case. I mean, you might not be in a Supreme Court case in your lifetime, but you're still a citizen. And so you're still like a fabric, you're a part of this fabric, our society. So you matter and you have a right to express yourself. And then, but there are limits on that. And that is, that's the fun and that's, that's the discussion. 
so. So because you are citizens in the fabric of our society, we want to know what questions or comments occurred to you as you're watching this video. Use the link below and send them directly to us and we'll answer them and talk through them on Constitution Day Live. In the meantime, check out our other videos we've designed for Constitution Day, including an analysis of the Constitution itself and why it is relevant to students, a trip to Mount Vernon to explore what historic structures can teach us about the complexity of our country's founding and more. We'll be exploring these issues all year, so stay involved with us on social media, look out for more events and ways to get involved. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel. You have to check out Civics 101 to hear Nick and his co-host Hannah, they're amazing. So again, Nick, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Gary. This has been an absolute delight. Yeah, thanks. It's been thanks for spending some time with us on Constitution Day. Anytime. <laughs> All right, we'll see you on Constitution Day, everybody. Until then, keep asking questions. <laughs>